Hi, this is uh, Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have Paige Hamilton of Helmet on the show. How you doing today, Paige? I'm great. How did Helmet form? Put an ad in the Village Voice in New York City in 1989 after a, a year in a band called Band of Susans and found my guys, John Stanier and Henry Bogdan. Put an ad in the Voice, and then my other friend Peter and I jammed with John, and then we put another ad in the Voice, Village Voice, and found Henry about a couple months later. Um, and uh, that was it. We just started just started playing, and I was writing all the time and working on my uh, my uh, four track and um, Amphetamine Reptile uh, Records in Minneapolis was the label that w was the most interested in us and also the most uh, uh, sincere and didn't talk any bull. Born Annoying was the first thing we did. It was that we we recorded our own stuff eight track with Donnie Fury in New York down in uh, in. Um, on Spring Street, and uh, we did that, sent that four-song thing out as our demo. I mean, a couple of major labels got it, and it went right over their heads. Uh, much like our new, much like our new album, and much like all our albums go over their heads. So Tom Hazelmeyer put out our first seven-inch, and um, we basically our payment was like 500 copies of the seven-inch. So we sold it door to door in New York, and you know, went around. Would you like to buy a few copies of this fabulous new band helmet? Yeah, it was great. And then we um, uh, we we started touring. We got in a van. Uh, Pete Davis from Creature Booking started putting us in a van and we went out and we just crashed on people's floors and, and played all over the country. 22 shows in a row at one point. Um, the punk yeah, ethos. Yeah, completely. Totally. You know, like, like the overnight drive from Lawrence to Albuquerque and, you know, after the gig with the four of us in the van. And um, and we got better and better, tighter uh, musically. And um, then we made Strap It On. And actually, had we made Strap It On at that point? Yeah. Um, and Strap It On came out and Rough Trade went under uh, shortly thereafter so the album was just sitting on warehouse floors somewhere in San Francisco but we got an opportunity to go to Europe with uh, four other Amphetamine Reptile bands and um, came home and it was and kind of all hell had broken loose because we, you know, we built our following on our own yeah. uh, you know after it took us a, about a year and a half of touring you know in a van and doing that maybe two years. Um, and so then the major labels started calling, and, and at that point it made sense because Hazelmeyer said, "Look, you know, you're, I can't keep up with this, the demand." So um, we signed to Interscope in '91, put out Meantime, Betty, and Aftertaste, and then split up in early '98 after touring. Now, what were some of the highlights of Meantime? Because I mean, that sold like over platinum. I don't know what the final numbers are on that or what it's at now. I know most people have probably downloaded at this point. I know it went gold for sure. Um, uh, the uh, the highlights, I mean, it was, we had a great time making that record. We'd, we had done some demos in Chicago with a guy named Steve Albini of, of Big Black fame and Rape Man and now Shellac. And, uh, um, this uh, very talented and uh, non-opinionated guy from uh, uh, Missoula. Um, he recorded, uh, we, I kind of wrote this song in the meantime in the studio. I had the two two main riffs for the song and we did another song called Rock Messiah which is bootlegged somewhere. I, I'm dying to find it. Um, and I think a, another song which was a demo for a song FBLA 2. Um, we ended up then going on, the, we were on the road, we recorded for a couple of days with him, continued to tour and then uh, signed the deal. We ended up liking Steve's demo of that song better, and then re but we recorded the rest of the album with Wharton Tears, um, who had done Strap It On as well, and um, who, we, if, if I have it my way, we will be doing the next album with. Um, he's amazing. He's great. He's done Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. and uh, John Spencer, you know, uh, uh, Pussy Galore. Um, I think he's worked with Nick Cave, you know, um, all kinds of bands. And he's just, he's incredible. How did you arrive at the name Helmet? We ha had a million stupid band names, including Polly Orchids, uh, Cry Ruth, um, which was an Australian expression, I guess, for vomiting after a good night of drinking. Peter Megaday was my good friend at the time. Um, and I spent a lot of time out partying and thinking of dumb names, and you know, John Henry and myself as well. Um, we were with his sister and his uh, girlfriend at the time, who was obsessed with Nick Cave, and who lived in Berlin for some time. And um, I, I lived in Germany as an exchange student, so I speak German. And uh, she was always throwing German things out at me, and you know, Nick Cave things or whatever. And she one day just at lunch said, Helmut, you should call the band Helmut. Uh, and you know, obviously, we didn't want the Germanic, Teutonic, whatever thing. But I was like, "Bung!" Light bulb went off. Helmet. That's it. Um, and it was—it just felt right. You know, it, it looks nice and it has other connotations that are, you know, 
appropriate for the name of a rock band and you know so it's it was it, it was good page how do you feel the the heavy music scene has changed since helmet first started i don't know which change we should start with but when uh, when i was forming the band and writing uh, things like repetition and rude and bad mood and some of the stuff that was on strap it on i had lived with a roommate who had mtv and every once in a while i would want to i would take a break because you can only spend so much time in your room playing guitar before you need a little sort of fresh air and i'd come out and i'd turn mtv on and watch uh, poison and winger and Warrant and Skid Row and all these bands that were playing quote unquote heavy music and I, ne I just didn't think it was heavy you know what I mean it never turned my crank and I don't, it's no com you know commentary on their their the uh, musical ability or songwriting ability or singing ability whatsoever they can all sing and play and write but I didn't I didn't there was no grit to it and um, so when we were a part of something that was uh, uh, wasn't dependent upon a major label. Um, you know, with no imagination to put, to put our records out and not know what to call the music. In fact, I gave the a demo tape to somebody at Atlantic, and they just like, we don't know what to call this, and and you know, industrial something or metal or whatever. The kids in the mailroom like it, but we don't, you know, we don't. How do we how do we sell this stuff? Um, one, you know, once kids get tired of kind of being spoon fed, which you know happens in uh, is a sort of a, you know uh, cyclically, and I think it's happening again. It happened, you know, around the time of uh, Nirvana and Helmet. Um, we, I mean, we played the Pyramid Club with Nirvana with their old drummer Chad, and and they they were coming up in Sub Pop when we were on Amrep, and people were going to shows, people were going to clubs, and when when people start to show that much interest in something because it's it's good and it's done for not for reasons of you know with uh, uh, you know the rock stardom or commercial you know we're just sitting around with you know commercial aspirations like you want to hang out at the Playboy Mansion or whatever you want to do rock music that turns you on and that's what always been my motivation and uh, that you started we started to see a change it lasted for a little while then all the bands that run indie labels ourselves you know helmet included got kind of swept up and we got paid and uh, you know ultimately that that kind of uh, you know, it's it's a catch one too because that created it rifts in the bands because there's obviously I'm the lead singer and the songwriter and the guitar player and and you know and then the other guys are, you know so you know I get it always happens, I, man. it's all ego it's the, it's the problem with rock music and there are very few bands you know the two come to mind you two and Radiohead that that uh, have, that understand their roles you know musically and it managed to stick together and realize I mean obviously you know in the case of you two they're also getting huge fat paychecks so they're not stupid. But, um, you know, I mean, the Rolling Stones, uh, you know, that's a business, you know, and they're, they're not sitting around, like Mick's not sitting around with a great passion to, you know, to, you know what I mean, for, for any political commentary or anything anymore. And I, I'm assuming, you know what I mean, and he's got a, you know, that castle mortgage is pretty high. Yeah. Helmet never had huge commercial success. We did have a gold record and we so, we managed to stay on the road and make a living. But things eventually splintered for us. And kind of in the wake of uh, the dissolution of Helmet, we, we did see a lot of bands that had adapted the kind of the minimalist riff approach to rock writing it's I mean any idiot can do what I do I mean they didn't come up with it in the first place but they can do it you know what I mean it just takes one finger and you drop the string and you play two notes or one you know in the meantime is one note you know what I mean it, it's 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 an interesting one note you know it's maybe it's a Zen exercise and you know, you know three against four or whatever but it's it's about feel and it's about you know trying to uh, to do something that's physical which put you know puts you in a different kind of emotional state than you know you know, you don't need to, you know, practice your rock postures in this music because it, it, it's got plenty of movement on its own. And um, that's, I think, um, then, the, then the awful uh, fusion of rap and rock uh, happened. We did the album with House of Pain and um, for the Judgment Night, and, and they asked me at the time, I remember I got interviewed, do you, do you think this could be another big genre? And I'm like, no, it's absolutely hideous. It'll never go anywhere, you know? So that's why I'm not an A&R guy. But um, so that thing exploded. Um, and you would hear bands that it's like you could would, are obviously influenced by the Beastie Boys and Helmet and you know Nine Inch Nails and Primus or whatever, and so all these things sort of got smashed into one. Um, and uh, n you know now that stuff is all kind of absorbed into the vocabulary of, of, of what you know what rock music is or what rock guitar is. And um, is it is it, it, it is it something that makes you happy or do you feel disappointed in what's what's happening with music? I uh, I don't really care you know. I, I never really spent that much time yeah, after I moved out of that house with, the, with with my friend that had an MTV I didn't have TV for a long time so I didn't watch any MTV and then uh, my ex-wife and I had a TV years later but um, uh, I, it doesn't 
it doesn't affect my um, my love of music one way or another. You know what I mean? It's like I don't I, I, I listen to music that I like, not music that I think I have to listen to. So I don't have to listen to you know things that are con considered contemporary because I can hear a band that is, is you put out their first album yesterday and, I, and and you know to me it sounds like a watered down version of you know of you, you know something that came out 20 or 30 years ago. So I don't you know I I spend most of my time listening to you know classical music and and it's uh, because it's a new, it's a new thing for me over the last 5 years i mean I, I did study it as an undergrad in college but not to the degree that i do now and you know if a rock band is great then i'll be you know radiohead they're a great band i've seen them play, play live several times and i have all their records and they're great and if they're not great i don't care if if it's you know if they they're considered sort of of our genre or not you know what i mean and so it doesn't you know as far as it taking money out of my pocket yeah do i wish i had you know the money that some of those bands have that have you know have adopted the helmet vocabulary sure you know i mean I would, i'd love to you know i'd be making music for you know tumbleweed and garbage cans if i did you know you can sell 50,000 records on an independent label and get in a van and go tour and you know, and make some money and do what you love to do. And it's, it's, I mean, at a certain point you have to sort of, you have to consider what's the best thing to, uh, for your band. I mean, we're in a, a position where Interscope called, called me after seven years and said, would you make a helmet record? And, and it gave me an opportunity to make another record. And I'm always looking for opportunities to, 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 you know, get songs finished and out on record and go tour, you know, and it's, and it's, it's fun. And, and, you know, now we have to kind of figure out, you know, as I realize, that it's it's not a main apparently not you know in, uh, doesn't work in conjunction with the programming on K Rock or whatever that uh, you know the the label kind of loses interest and now how do we figure out how to make the next record you know what I mean so we but we do have a working band and we can play shows and sell T-shirts and in some way pay for our pay for our next record you know or we'll take we'll accept donations too for a while there you were working on film scores what did you take away from that time working on film scores which which you brought to this new helmet record there's a certain uh, freedom uh, and and certainly a lot you know a, a lot less pressure I mean if I'm paying if I'm being hired a hired gun guitar player to perform on some orchestral score they're bringing me in to kind of rescue them usually you know what I mean they're like oh shit we need something different what do we do here well let's get this guy that plays these weird crappy noises and you know we'll, we'll you know we'll, we'll ruin all this beautiful orchestra stuff with his guitar and um it it it, it helped me kind of develop a sonic you know, um a, a, a broader sonic palette to draw from i spent more time experimenting with pedals and sounds and it kind of also freed me up f form wise so when i did sit down to write a pop song for you know a rock song whatever the verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus structure I you know I I was ha happy doing that because I it, it was you went from a, a nine minute uh, cue of like you know gun f fight and cars crashing you know that was more of a free form orchestral piece with three sections over you know that developed into like I like stuff that's I immediate and has impact and I still ACDC is still my favorite band in the world and I want to you know have here a chorus and a, and a riff that punches you in the face yeah. so it I mean it, it worked on a lot of different levels it, it made me play more guitar it uh, helped pay my rent in order to you know uh, to, to continue doing this so I could get this band back together which is was important as well and uh, and it, it you know it, it, it gave me a certain uh, freedom to to work you know in a, in a, in a different environment Page, now you were in a band in 2002 called Gandhi, and this was kind of like your project thing that you put together. What, what was the sound of this? I'm curious. It sounded like Helmet with different players. I mean, everything I write kind of <laughs> sounds like Helmet, I guess. I mean, the the the. Uh, the good news and the bad news with uh, uh, me as a rock musician is that I play the way I play, I sing the way I sing, and I write the way I write. I don't play open position chords, and, you know, and when I write, I play drop tuning, and I have my voicings and, and my feel, and, you know, I have my limitations as, you know, in, in, in all areas, you know, and so, it, but but the, some of the parts is, is you know, um, adds up to something that's unique, it's its own thing, and I always, I mean, my favorite singers are, you know, 
Bon Scott, Iggy Pop, you know, guys like that that have extremely distinctive voices and they might not, you know, I mean, Bon Scott technically is phenomenal and yeah. I challenge anyone to do that. But um, but also the feel and the, the intensity is amazing. And, and I just, I like singers that go for it. You toured with David Bowie. Now, what was that experience like? I was amazing. I mean, it was nerve wracking at first because I had about a week to learn, you know, I think 30 songs or something like that. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like I, I had been, I had a rough night of partying and everybody was calling me at 5 p.m. I was crashing on my manager's couch at the time because I just uh, separated from my wife and uh, uh, four in the afternoon I came came in and uh, the messages were off the hook you know where the hell are you manager business manager you know lawyers everybody calling me and it's like you know Bowie's trying to reach you and I was like yeah right whatever you know be there at five you know so I went out and got a pack of cigarettes and showed up at five and, and sure, sure enough you know the, the, the it's hit five o'clock and there's David hi Paige it's David Bowie and I was like no shit <laughs> Um, so uh, it was an absolute, you know, thrill, obviously. And when I broke Betty, I had Aladdin Sane next to the bed every night, my vinyl copy, and I'd looking at the lyrics and just, you know, playing the record every day. And you, know, you just go through different things with different artists that mean a lot to you. And obviously, you know, to, to, to sit around that guy every day and, you know, eat Chinese food at LaGuardia Airport and talk about songwriting is, is, uh, is you know, going to have some kind of impact on you as a musician, you know. And it was, he was a sweetheart, he's great, and he's brilliant. And so, you know, it was just a great experience. It was it was a lot of work because I'm not, and I told him, I said, like, I'm not really a guitar player, you know. I'm kind of like a shit sculptor or whatever. So it's like, you know, but he's like, oh, come on, you know. So he told me in 97 when I met him at a festival that he was a helmet fan. And I, I you know, yeah, so I was kind of like, Whoa. yeah, right. That's a compliment. <laughs> Oh, absolutely, yeah, of course. It's, it's easy, yeah. But it was cool. It was really good. It was an honor. Now, now you were playing lead on this tour, right? With Bowie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, my own kind of inimitable style. Well, he, I mean, <laughs> I call it slop, but Reeves, you know. Well, Reeves Gabriel had this real like whammy bar kind of like frippish type style. Would you say that you were you you attained that there? No, I, David said uh, uh, to me, you know, do you know anything you want when you know it, w within the context of the music that's in the, you know that works with the music. He didn't put any limitations on me. He said, don't try to play like Reeves. If you don't want to do the slide part, don't do it. That's Come, amazing. So I, I was coming up with with. Things Things like you know, uh, there, there was a slide part on a song from um, the Hours album, and uh, I, I, I suck at slide, and I don't like to play it, and so I, I said like, I don't want to do that, and he's like, don't do it, do something else. So I ended up <laughs> coming up with a really weird neck position, uh, wah wah pedal back, like really muted, uh, almost like cello tone kind of thing. It forced me to experiment and try other things out, and it was really, uh, it was great, and he was completely encouraging. I mean, there were days I'm sure he was just like, Jesus, you know, just play this song, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like you're so you're so slow you know I'm like yeah I'm, I'm really methodical you know I mean so you can hear it in the in helmet that music is about the arrangement and then I just sort of splatter you know guitar paint over the top of it you know and like I make sure I have great players that can play the songs and play the arrangements tight and then I can kind of mess them up with my crappy guitar solos <laughs> now yeah. you also hung out with Bono that happened through uh, Elliot Goldenthal who's one of my heroes that I've been fortunate over the last 10 years to do a, a, a lot of movies with and his opera that he's working on transposed heads uh, Heat, Titus in Dreams, Good Thief. Uh, Good Thief was the movie with Bono. Neil Jordan was the director. He lives in Ireland. We demoed That's Life with a drum machine, and, and um, uh, Elliot was like, let's see if, you know, Neil wants to see if Bono would dig this, and he, and he, he loved it, and so he came out, and we had to redo it, obviously, for the movie um, in the right key. And, um, it was it was really fun. I mean, it was Elliot's thing and Tis, uh, uh, Matthias Goal, Elliot's producer, those guys. Uh, you know, they they do everything and they just hire me and you know they throw a lot of suggestions at me and and they they know my my guitar vocabulary fairly well now and and Bono came in and sang it and it sounded great. You know, I think it, he, he, I think he had just done the Super Bowl, so his voice was all raspy and thrashed and it sounded cooler than usual to me, like because he's got such a pure uh, vo uh, voice. It's such a, a unique. The sounding pure voice, and I and sometimes I think, God, you know, I'd love to hear his voice if it was really like distorted and fucked up. You know what I mean? And it was that day. It was kind of like uh, I think he, you know, had a few too many whiskeys or something, yeah, and uh, and a lot of cigarettes, and it sounded really cool. So that was a, and he was freaking out over my guitar playing. I don't know what it is. People that have, that are kind of more in tune with 
uh, musical feel than technical things seem to really like what I do. You know what I mean? And people that want to hear like technically perfect performances hate what I do, I guess. But I just have no long-term memory, so I can't remember anything. So it's like, it's kind of new every time I pick up the guitar. Oh, look at this, you know? So I don't really have a bag of tricks so much. I mean, I know my scales and chords and I, you know, yeah. I studied jazz or whatever, but it's still, it's like, it's kind of, it's, I, I always have a, a way too much distortion going. And so that, there's a lot of happy accidents. And I think people like, you know, with Bono Elliott, you know, Bowie, they appreciate that kind of stuff. And they realize that it's nice to have some kind of fuzzy edges and stuff sort of seeping out the bottom of the container a little bit. We were playing, I can't remember where the gig was. It was in uh, Geneva. And I played a, 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 I played a guitar solo that I just, I, I thought was just so amazing. I was practically patting myself on the back. I mean, I was just like, wow, I don't know what I did there. You know, it's like, and that's like one out of a hundred, you know, for me. So I'm just, I was like, wow, that was great. And I completely missed my entrance on the chorus of the song. I was just like, that was so good. And they're playing and I was just like, where am I? There are people that want to hear me sing the chorus of the song, you know? So it's like, you get so excited when you have these happy accidents. I'd rather, I guess, be like that than go out every night and just be like, yeah, I saw you last night and your solo was exactly the same as it was the night before, 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 you know? So it's just saying. What inspired the title of Size Matters? Well, um, uh, my friend John Ewing su uh, suggested it when we had another thing, sitting around throwing around stupid titles, and I thought um, it, I, it was immediately that was the, the one. The, the, the first thing is the obvious juvenile reference, you know, to p uh, uh, penis size, which is, you know, I, you know, that stuff always works. You know, I mean, farting and penis jokes are always funny. So I don't care who you are. Um, and um, the the other connotations, the way I sold it to the label and my manager, who were like, "What? Come on, grow up," was. Uh, we, you, you st when you start to think about it, and the, you know the, 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 what, what can be implied in a, in, a, in a title, and you think about sort of the, the capitalist condition, specifically America, because I live here and this is where I've grown up and will continue to live, um, that we're, there's a, an absolute obsession with you know, uh, uh, you know, bigger, better, faster, louder. You know, I mean, you want to be a star. Everybody wants to be on reality shows and have 15 minutes of fame and get married in front of millions of TV viewers and have, and it's it's there's there is absolutely no, or very little, certainly in the mainstream media, um, that would encourages someone to, you know, pursue any kind of spiritual, you know, beliefs whatsoever. You know what I mean? And it's and it's, or anything such as music, which is a a, a, a form of spiritual pursuit. You know, it's not a fucking commercial, you know, uh, sh you know, garbage bag full of shit that it's turned into, and it's it's disgusting, and it's 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 sickening that somebody all they want to do is be a rock star and like fucking get on the cover of Rolling Stone and hang out and get their, you know, get their dick sucked when when you know music provides so much more for you. I mean, it really does, and it's like, and we're and the reason that rock music sucks so bad and that that uh, so much rap sucks is because people. They're they're only concerned about having hits and getting on the cover of magazines and it's like and it's it's destroying pop music and I consider pop music to be a potential you know potentially great art form as classical music and jazz are you know people have done amazing things with with a, a guitar and it's still untapped that's why I play the electric guitar and not jazz and not anything else I feel like it's untapped there's still things to be done with it you know and if you're but if you're gonna be content to rip off Nirvana and rip off you know whoever else you know Pantera or helmet or you know nice nails then you know you're not bringing anything to the vocabulary of music and that's that's in a sense that's what our entire culture is as is, is about and it's getting you know in my opinion as I, you know the last 20 years I, I've witnessed it you know and I feel it's getting worse and worse and there is people kids are not encouraged I, I was encouraged I went to the NAMM show the other day and there was a 14 year old kid who'd been playing three years soprano saxophone sitting in with some other musicians a dear friend of mine John Stowell who's a j great jazz guitar player he's like 50 years old and other guys that were 60 years old playing a Coltrane song called Giant Steps anyone familiar with it it's a revolutionary set of chord changes when he he delivered it in 1959 like these chords moving in minor thirds uh, impossible I mean this 14 year old kid had learned Giant Steps he was playing it at a mid tempo not up to tempo but was playing it he was so excited to be playing and I you know so the, I know there are kids out there that 
are, have passion about music and want to want to play music. They're not just interested in being rock stars and being on reality shows and and you know having Pro Tools fix their lousy guitar yeah, playing and vocals. Exactly. You don't even need to be a musician anymore, yeah. dude. She can't sing. She's making a lot of money and she's making her record company a lot of money. And but you, what the record company should do is realize you know we got a free pass with this stuff. We're selling something that's not music, so let's also invest some money in music. You know, I mean, why not? Why not have a thing where where they they sign bands to fifty thousand, seventy five thousand dollar deals and develop them over the course of two years, and yeah. you know, get them to work with you know uh, people like me, yeah. for example, that would you know break their butt and teach them to play in time and sing. Talking about size matters. What is the significance of the cover? Now, this is. A lot of people may think it's very controversial. A little girl looking through a magnifying glass and then the title size matters. The initial attraction was that it was a beautiful photo and the sort of innocence and open-mindedness that kids have uh, uh, about things and she's got a magnifying glass up to her, her, her eye so you can see her eyeball enlarged and it sort of implies, you know, uh, you know, upon closer inspection, you know, and so just, you know, that, you, you know, it, kids, you know, st I believe start out with, you know, natural inquisitiveness and, and, and a natural open-mindedness and they, they will do the right thing as this for 14 year old kid that was playing soprano sax is like but eventually like if if we continue to you know fill them full of shit that they will you know they can be swayed and they you know they can absolutely you know develop the wrong notion of what you know and, you know i'm not saying you you know you shouldn't have a desire to make money and you shouldn't try to make it or whatever i'm not saying any of those things but that th those are those are those should be you know products of of uh, you know discipline and 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 work and and you know sort of you know, some you know sense of responsibility about something and you you will become a. I, I guarantee you, if you if you adhere to any sort of um, you know musical discipline and you you study and you work at music, you will become a better human being. I guarantee it. If your path is is strictly you know superficial rock stardom, movie stardom, whatever you're good looking, you will you probably not benefit from what you what there is to learn along the way. You will probably become a creepier human being. What music does, the focus on something other than your own ego and other than yourself, a guitar, an inanimate object that you will never master. No one will ever master the guitar. They will become good guitar players, but Segovia could not play what Wes Montgomery could not play. Jimi Hendrix plays. You know what I mean? There are all these amazing things that can be done with the guitar so you're focusing on you know something that's that's it's kind of part of the universe you don't know where inspiration comes from there there are days when you have no inspiration and you work and you work and the discipline hopefully creates some inspiration for you but then miraculously some it, you know from somewhere some you know great riff or motif or melody or wor you know line or something comes to you and so but it's part of the discipline and digging that sort of removing the asphalt bef you know and grading the road before you can you know uh, put something down on it and it's and it, it what what that does is it takes your focus away from you and your day-to-day -day problems you and your ego you and me 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 what is what's you know and and it it you know it develops you know a kind of a, a more you know spiritual mind it's a good it's a good thing i guarantee it is the song see you dead autobiographical the majority of the songs in this album are pulled from personal experience yeah okay. uh, you know not to get too much into you know relationship relationships etc uh, they are yeah they are autobiographical and, and it's and I'm you know in a way you feel uh, you feel fortunate to have had you know to have been in love and to have have had those experiences or to have relied on you know friends period because it's not it's not always about you know a, a broken relationship you know whatever they're also relationships you have with friends male or female where they let you down in some way mm -hmm. and so these this it's always interested me and and it's always fascinated me and and it, uh, um, I've let people down too I you know we're all capable of it so that's the, the kind of generally that's what I tend to write about sometimes I put it in a social context and I you know it starts with a personal experience and then I step back and say well everybody you know suffers from this or everybody is guilty of this and it's it's the human condition is is you know has been the human condition yeah, for thousands of years I mean Graham Greene can write about something that I can completely relate to and you know f uh, that, that happened to him in 1950 you know or I mean, it's you know Joseph Conrad or whoever. It's all, it's all, it's all there. It's nothing new. I mean, when I read Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce, you know, it's like yeah, 
you know, catcher in the rye. Yeah, I know what he's, exactly what he's talking about, you know, and you're 18, 19, 20 years old. And it's, it's so you, you, uh, these, these things tend to be universal, but, but they, but you still need the personal experience to sort of have, have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, verbiage to, to, to use in some way. And I mean, See You Dead was uh, basically me, I was inspired by John Lennon, uh, Run For Your Life, I'd Rather See a Dead Little Girl Than Be With Another Man off no, um, Rubber Soul, you know, the Beatles song. And uh, it's like, I always thought that was great, 1964, whatever. He's like, I'd rather see a dead little girl than to be with another man. You know, I'm like, wow. You know, and the flack that I got for this song, for winning it for a single in 2004, was was unbelievable. That in 64, the Beatles could put that album out. And here, we're more sort of a puritanical, whatever, p politically correct, you know, that you, you know we're going to clan, you know, you can't s sing that. And, you know, I guess they were right because radio didn't play it. <laughs> the song Throwing Punches, did you know a girl like this? Originally, the subject was was a male. Okay. Uh, I thought he was a hit, started throwing punches. And then um, after I had another experience with a, in a relationship, I decided that it, that it worked better to have a girl throwing punches, you know what I mean? To, to that, you know, metaphorically speaking, I mean, it wasn't. It, well, it happens. It does yeah. happen. I've had, you know, a few punches thrown my way by, you know, uh, g girlfriends, whatever, but um, it wasn't, yeah, I was, I was uh, using throwing punches as a, you know, metaphor for, I think, uh, unjust treatment of boyfriend <laughs> <You know? laughs> I of course was an angel yeah. <laughs> <And> always <happened. laughs> um, now the song smart is this a lesson or an experience uh, uh, well both to a certain extent my the the, 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 the place that 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 took place uh, it was a bar that I spent way too much time in New York City a block from my apartment called 2A and a bar stool and uh, part of the reason I had to leave New York a full t you know I lived there uh, part-time in LA and part-time in New York uh, was I spent way too much time in that bar and do, you know with beer goggles on and in a late night pathetic you know hmm she she looks good, you know. <laughs> I did a, I did too much of that, and uh, it was uh, so I was kind of poking fun at my at myself with that song. It really works. It's I think it's fun. and poking fun at the per, at a, a, a person in particular that I always talked about how smart she was, you know. Now the song "Everybody Loves You." Mm -hmm. Now I can feel the anger in that song. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Uh, directed at a male, and um, there you could sort of pull a few people into that this is sort of um, a little bit what we were getting into earlier about the album title and ego and uh, uh, you know people equating you know f uh, financial success commercial success in any in any field in any profession with success you know it's sort of uh, you know you can you can be a bastard because you've got all the money I mean there's the lines in the song I can't you know, think off the top of my head but um, you know, everybody loves you. You're adored. You're adored. Everybody loves a shameless liar. You know, and it's like, and it's yeah, it's 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 a you know, it is Jazz Coleman said to me, he writes songs of character assassination, and that's what that one is. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, it sounds to me like you have taken up your flag against narcissism mm -hmm. in society, and and I mean, we I talk about this with my friends. Narcissism is totally taking over. That's that. Yeah, that sort of self absorption. I know what you mean. Yeah, the and, narcissism. and and and. You're, and the whole thing is, is that, like you were saying with music, it's like they're, the mu it's no longer about music; it's about self, mm -hmm. selfishness, mm -hmm. and 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 also you're saying, hey, success is not about how much money and power you have; it's about what's what ultimately happens in your heart and mm -hmm. what kind of person you're created into. Mm -hmm. And and in you're trying to bring that back. Well, I, I, I'm not trying to. I'm not. Go, I'm not going to succeed. I mean, like you know, devil will win. You know, you 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 do what you have to follow your heart. You have to do what you believe in. And I can't. I you know, if someone is, comes in and says and tells me to write a hit, I, I you know. I, what does that mean? Does that mean write what is on the radio right now? Because I don't like it, and, mm -hmm. I, and I can't, I, I can't do it. I've been fortunate that enough people. There's a small percentage of, you know, of the population out there that wants to hear something that is that does kind of stand on its own. You know, they'll, they'll. I mean, Helmet fans will complain about every record. You know, every record I put out, they're like, it's not Meantime, it's not Strap It On, it's not Betty, it's not Aftertaste. You know, when five years from now, it's not. You know, Size Matters. There's yeah. always they want 
want to hear something they're more familiar with, but you have to continue to progress. And ultimately, you know, when I'm, you know, laying down and about to, to, to die, I know that, you know, every time I, I picked up the guitar that I, I, I did I have pu sort of purely musical thoughts. You know what I mean? I wasn't trying to do something for effect. It's not premeditated music. I'm, 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 you know, first of all, I don't think I'm technically, you know, capable of pulling off anything that I want to pull off, you know, as a singer, a writer or a player. And uh, secondly, I don't think I, I, I would, I think I would get sick writing a song like that. You know, it's like, I, I, I not that I don't want people to enjoy the music, I do, but on my terms, you mm -hmm. know, and I think you, you have to, you know, you kind of have to, uh, you kind of hope that people appreciate that on, on some level. And, and it's like, I always felt uh, from the very beginning that if people heard Helmet, they would like it. And I was right. Yeah. And we started on an indie label and we, we brought people along and, and, and the major labels had to pay attention and sort of put it into the mainstream for a minute. And then that all sort of got taken over and, and, and watered down and, yeah. and 10 years later, here we are. So you, you, but, you, but I did, you know, my musical progression, you know, progress has, hasn't, you know, hasn't been stultified you know I mean I wake up on some days and I hate what I do and other but other days that work pays off and good things come out of it and so I can't I can't sit around and like you know criticism or praise whatever people want to say about this album I have I still have to believe it myself at an early age you develop the discipline and and and, and like this 14 year old kid at the NAMM show playing the saxophone he loves music he wanted to get up and play giant steps in front of people at the NAMM show his so and your focus is on music and then and you maintain that path even if you get knocked off from time to time and you still when I still go home I sit down, I'm in my own woodshed by myself with a guitar, and it's all about my love of music, not about people adoring me. It's yeah. not what it's about. And it's like, and you know, I love playing live shows and I love, you know, the interaction with an audience, but still when I go home, I sit and I have that discipline for the last 25 years. And that's what, you know, that that's that will ultimately if 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 you have that, if I end up, you know, a, a stockbroker when I'm 60 years old, I know I can still wake up and play the guitar and enjoy that music. You know, people can't take music away from me. They try. Yeah. They it, will I, try to ruin it for you. And it's don't ask me why, but it's 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 been I've I've experienced it from the very beginning of my you know time as a musician. While I, when I was in college, people telling me I sucked or whatever, and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna quit. I suck. You know, and then I go home and I put on a Jim Hall record, and I'm like, oh my god, yeah, I forget all about it because I'm you're so drawn into this this. Amazing, you know, art form, you know, spiritual that's, experience. It's the best. That's know? like what punk was for me. The punk rock is an aesthetic. To me, Charlie Parker is punk rock. And my punk rock growing up in a small town was Charlie Parker. I mean, because all the mainstream bands that were on the radio at the time were Toto, Journey, Foreigner, things like that, were more slick rock bands. Yeah. And I, I was like, I kind of rebelled against that. Like all my friends had Boston records. And I, I thought, I'm going to find my own thing. And so I discovered jazz. And that was punk rock for me because it was, you know, none of my friends liked it you know what I mean so it, it, it was way cooler and that's you know so you find you find your way and then you, you know unknowingly you know there's this this incredibly deep art form of you know that's developed from the blues through you know from uh, 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 you know Louis to Duke to bird to trained to miles you know monk all, you know all the way and you know later players like uh, you know Shep or, or David Murray these guys that have continued this tradition is like you see you're tapping into something that is you know greater than us and that's what music is it's greater than us. So what did additional producers Charlie Clouser and Jay Baumgartner bring to Size Matters? Um, Charlie was the, the first real collaboration that I experienced. As part of Nine Inch Nails, he had a studio set up in Trent Reznor's studio down in New Orleans, and those guys were so gracious and generous with, with uh, uh, their time and space and gear and things, and they set up a, my own room for me, and I, I you know, ate all their food in their refrigerator and worked, and it gave me an opportunity to kind of get away from New York and sit down there and learn some new, in, uh, new ways to, to develop develop and write things, you know, namely working in the computer and with synthesizers and stuff. And it starts, it's just a, it sort of kind of frees you up from habits that you can get in after working in one way for 12 or 13 years. And uh, so Charlie and I wrote a lot of st stuff together and, you know, about half of what we wrote ended up on the album, like three out of the six songs or something that we ended up finishing ended up on the Helmet album. And um, uh, so that was amazing. I mean, he, he's still kind of, I still call him, you know, 
Uh, yeah, I want to use this string sample, and I can't figure out uh, where I open it up. And, you know, and he's like, uh, yeah, okay, just go to the view menu. You know, he's, he's still like like total guru in that yeah. way with me and a, and a good friend. Um, Jay has it comes from a completely different world of like, as he would describe it, you know, as a 14-year-old, you know, metalhead, I want to hear you go yeah, right at the end of the song and like this, you know. And he has, he has an outsider's perspective. He's a musician, but he's, you know, spends more time engineering and producing and mixing than playing music now and so he's just a fan and he is a, you know I have I have it together enough as a songwriter and singer and guitar player to arrange and write and arrange the songs I just have to put my push my ego aside with Jay and say he's like we need to cut that section in half I want to hear that next section now you know what I mean yeah. it's like that was really constructive and useful for me I know other bands have said oh Jay didn't do anything for us I mean for me it was amazing what is your mission statement I love you know, the fact that I get to wake up every day and think about music the way you come up with I guess original ideas is that that you, you you have sort of the luxury of time and 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 you know every day to wake up and do that you know if I, I've worked a million jobs as I was a student and grad student and all those things and, and uh, I want to just I, I would like to see this band continue because I'm enjoying myself I'm proud of the record I'm proud of the live performances and um, you know and and then I'll, I continue to develop other things when I'm you know I'm horsing around with orchestras and stuff right now and and you just you know music is kind of I chose music as a, a life because because it, it, it did something to me, you know, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and I knew that it would never, I would never, you know, the well would never run dry. I would yeah. never tap every, everything that you could do with music. And I've, so far, you know, my life's half over and that's, that's proven true. Like, I'm still excited about it every single day, you know, and that's that's what I want to continue to do. You know? Tell me about the Gavin Rosdale album you're producing. Uh, I think they just accepted it. Uh, we did, uh, I think we did about 15, 16 songs. I can't remember. I'll, I'll see Gavin tomorrow. He's going to bring everything in. He did a song with the Fote guy that I wasn't involved with. Um, and it, I hope it, we get it mixed this year. We're talking about having Jay Baumgartner mix it because Gavin likes our mixes and Gavin this, will be there. Does this album kick ass? Is it it's, going to kick ass? Yeah, it's going to. I, I, well, I'm, I mean, you know, not patting myself on the back, but I think it's going to be, you know, better than any and every Bush album, you know. I'm, I, we did some really great arrangement. Gavin has an amazing uh, melodic sense and a beautiful voice. And, I, you know, I was teasing about his beautiful voice, you know. It's, and But he does. He has a really cool sounding voice, sings in tune and, you know, knows how to sing. And he, and he has his great, you know, the great melodies. And, and, and then there's sort of, I tighten the arrangement, arrange up, add rhythm hits and things like that. And just sort of like, you know, um, uh, I, I added a few guitar things in there. But Chris, who plays in Helmet with me, played most of the guitar. Are and and uh, Gavin is playing on every song as well. So I had a lot of fun. You know, it's it's it, it'll be a good album. Thanks, Paige, sir. it's been great having right. you on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. The Blaring Out show.